If you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it not going your own ways or seeking your own pleasure or talking idly, then you shall take delight in the Lord. And I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. May God add his blessing to the reading and to the hearing of his holy word. Well, we are continuing in our sermon series on the Ten Commandments. Today we are looking at the fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And I can already feel you pushing back against me in your minds. I can already hear what you're thinking, oh, pastor, in today's world, you can't possibly expect that we would take one day of rest out of every seven. Oh, pastor, in today's world, you can't expect that this commandment still holds force. I mean, you don't understand how busy I am. You don't understand how much is on my to-do list. I have so much, so many plates I'm keeping spinning, so many balls I'm juggling in the air. I have to take the kids here and there and everywhere, and they're so involved. They have so much energy. They have so many activities, and I have so many expenses, so many bills. I just have to work that second job, and there's no way I can keep the two schedules right in my mind. There's no way with those two jobs that I can have a day off each week. Pastor, you can't possibly expect expect me to slow down and rest. I never learned how to slow down and rest. I can't sit still. I always have to have something to do. I always have to be busy. And at this stage of my life, I'm not inclined to learn any new skills. Thank you very much. Pastor, you can't possibly expect that we would take a day of rest each week. Well, yes, I absolutely can expect that. And in spite of all of our objections, in spite of all of our fears and our anxieties around the thought of slowing down and having a day in which we do no work, God still says, and it applies as much today as to when he originally said it because the Ten Commandments are still in force. God still says that one day out of every seven belongs to him. God still commands that we take a day for worship, for rest, and for fun. That we take a Sabbath each week. The Hebrew word for Sabbath literally means a cessation, a ceasing from our toil, ceasing from our labors. And God says this, not me. If you've got a problem with this, take it up with God. Okay, don't take it up with me. I have no authority here to say that this is in force or not in force. This is God's command. And he obviously thought this was important enough that he put it in his top 10. So God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy because he reserves the right to determine for us the way we understand time. God is the inventor of time. And we all have a rhythm that we follow, a rhythm to the day, a rhythm to the week, a rhythm to the month and the year. God reserves the right to tell us what that rhythm should be. He's the one that created our days and weeks and years, and he says that time belongs to him. Listen to what he says here in this command. In six days the Lord made heaven and earth the sea and all that is in them. And he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, he blessed the Sabbath day and he made it holy. 
In other words, God built into the very fabric of creation this idea of a Sabbath, this idea of one day in seven belonging to him, one day in seven being not about how much we can accomplish and do, but about being with him, being with each other, resting and worshiping and taking joy out of life. He decreed from the very beginning, life is about more than getting things done. Life is about more than work, more than accomplishing all that we can accomplish. There are times we need to stop and cease. There are times we need to rest and to worship. Times we need to remember it's not up to us to keep all of the plates spinning and all of the balls juggling in the air. And notice this commandment is written, God is very specific here, for all kinds of living things. God goes out of his way to say this commandment is for men and for women. This commandment is for the masters and the rich of society and the servants and the poor of society. This is for you Israelites and for the Gentiles, for the sojourners, the aliens, the outsiders of society. They are to rest as well. And he says this is for human beings and for your animals, your livestock, all living creatures are to rest one day each week and to remember God is the one in charge, not us, to be still and know that he is God. And that is profoundly countercultural. It has always been countercultural. Believe me, I understand. You read back in the ancient literature, and they write about how strange the Jewish people are that one day out of seven they stop working. They couldn't understand that. Why on earth would the Jews insist on this? It's so weird, it's so strange. And today, aren't we saying the same thing? You mean one day out of seven I'm not supposed to work? That's, <coughs> that's odd. Everybody works 24-7, don't they? Especially here in America, we are so busy. And if we're honest with ourselves, we're a little proud of the fact that we're so busy. If we're honest with ourselves, we feel a little guilty when we're not busy and doing something and accomplishing something because the fact that we're so busy, the fact that we're so involved, the fact that we're doing so much and working all the time, if we're honest with ourselves in the back of our minds, we think, well, look how important I am, that I am so necessary. Look how valuable my life is, that I have all these things that I have to do, and wouldn't everything come crashing down if I weren't there? I'm preaching to myself right now, by the way, more than anybody else. We like the fact that we're so busy. We complain about it, but we like the fact that we have so much to do. And God says, no. God says no to that. God says no to valuing human life according to how much we are able to do. God says no to saying I am valuable and important because I can do so much and accomplish so much. God says no to that because that is a dangerous slope to go down because what happens when we can't work anymore? What happens when age or illness or injury means we can't do as much. Do we mean then that that person's life is not as worthwhile as the people who can do so much? We're heading that way in our society. And God says, no, you will not define yourself by how much you can accomplish. No, you will not say life is about me working and getting things done. You will take one day out of every seven, one seventh of your life, 
will be about being, not doing. Resting, not working. Worshiping, not building a monument to yourself. We see this especially in Deuteronomy chapter 5, which is the other part in Scripture where the Ten Commandments are given. We've been reading out of Exodus chapter 20, the first giving of the Ten Commandments. And in the first giving of the Ten Commandments, God gives a reason for the fourth commandment. You will take a Sabbath because I took a Sabbath when I created the world. When you read Deuteronomy 5, he gives a different reason for the Sabbath. He says, one day out of seven will be a day of rest and worship, for you shall remember, he says, that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. And the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. You were slaves, God says. For 400 years, none of you had a single day off. Because you don't give slaves a day off, do you? Slaves, wherever they are held, are considered to be not humans. Slaves are just living tools. And you don't give your broom a day off. You don't give your shovel a day off. So why would you give your slave a day off? A slave is as valuable as the work that that slave can accomplish. And when the slave can't accomplish the work anymore, you get rid of it. God says, don't you dare go back to that way of thinking. Don't you dare regress to valuing your life according to how much you can do. That's what slaves, the way slaves are treated. And you are not slaves. I rescued you from that. So one day out of seven, you will not work. You will have a day of rest. You will remember that you are valuable and you are important simply because I created you in my image. Whether you can work or not, you are valuable and you are important because I am valuable and important and I care for you. This is a gift that God is giving to us. The Sabbath is a gift of time. And he calls us to honor him with this gift, to honor him with our time, and to keep this day, this holy day, the Lord's day, to keep it separate and distinct. And traditionally speaking, remembering the Sabbath and keeping it holy involves three things. We've already mentioned them. Rest, worship, and play. The Sabbath is about worshiping, resting, and playing. First off, a day to worship. We need to worship. We need to worship the Lord. That's what we were created for. That's what life is all about. Life is to be lived in worship for the Lord. And the Sabbath gives us time to do that. The Sabbath gives us time to stop from working, to worship God, and to be with each other. God knew... If he didn't write it on the calendar for us, it wouldn't happen. Some of you know what that's like. If you don't write it down, if it doesn't get on your calendar, on your to-do list, on your agenda, it doesn't happen, right? That's how my life is. So God put it on the calendar. One day each week, we're to stop and worship him. He gives us the gift of time. For the Jewish people, this happened beginning sundown on Friday night through sundown on Saturday. That's how they reckoned the day, from sundown to sundown. So Friday evening, the Sabbath began with a family meal. And then on Saturday, they went to the synagogue and they worshiped. We Christians moved the day of the Sabbath from Friday night to Saturday night. We moved it to Sunday because on the first day of the week, Jesus rose again from the dead. And so we gather on that first day of the week and we celebrate the resurrection every week. Every week is a mini Easter and we rest and worship God on that day. And along with worship, as I said, we rest and we, like the Jewish people, have to arrange our lives in such a way so that we can rest. When God gave this commandment, the manna from heaven was still falling. And God said, there will be no manna on the Sabbath day. 
If you go out and you try to gather up manna for food to eat that day, there isn't going to be any. So on the sixth day, you better go out and gather double. You better plan. Arrange your life in such a way so that you can have a day of rest. Now, of course, there were still things that had to be done. The animals had to be fed. The cows had to be milked. There were emergencies on the Sabbath day. God made provisions for those things. But he was very clear in Exodus chapter 34. He said both during the plowing time and the harvest time, the two busiest times of the year, nevertheless, even though you have all this work to do, you will take a day of rest. You still need a day of rest, even in the busiest times of the year. But along with worship and along with rest, the Sabbath was also to be a day of joy, a day of fun. As I said, it began with a family meal, and it was the best meal of the week. Like we used to talk about Sunday dinner. The Sabbath meal was the best meal of the week, and for for many Jewish people throughout the centuries, it was the only meal they got to eat meat because meat was too expensive to eat every day. But on the Sabbath, you made your best meal. And it was a long, lingering meal where people lingered over the table and enjoyed each other's company because there was nothing on the agenda. We were in no hurry. We could sit around the table and talk and enjoy each other's company and play games and have hobbies, and have more to life than just grinding hard work all the time. And God knew if he didn't set a day apart for that for us, we would never do it. If we don't work to carve out time each week for joyful things, for spending time with family, for taking joy out of life, If we're not careful, we're going to be working 24-7. And God says no to 24-7. He says, I've got a gift for you. One day out of every week where you can remember what life is all about. Sabbath is a gift. Why are we so hesitant and so resistant to accept this gift from the Lord? There's a story that's been passed down on my mother's side of the family uh, from down through the generations of one of my ancestors, I can't remember how many greats or great-grandfather, that traveled west in the 19th century. And those of you that remember your American history, traveling west was a dangerous thing to do. It was a difficult thing. And timing was everything. You couldn't leave until a certain point in the year when travel became possible, but you had to get west by a certain point in the year or else the snows would begin to fall in the mountains and you weren't going to make it. You would die before you made it to Oregon or California or wherever you were going. So timing was everything. And my ancestor was traveling with a group because you didn't travel alone. There were too many dangers. There were wild animals. You could have an accident. There were Native Americans that might possibly attack. There are all kinds of things that go wrong. So you traveled in a group, and the group said, we need to make sure we get west by a certain time, so we're going to travel seven days a week. And my ancestor, the contrarian, that must be a strong genetic trait, my ancestor said, no, I will not travel on the Sabbath. I need to rest. My animals need to rest. God commanded it, I'm going to do it. And the group said, you can do what you want. We're going to keep on going. And according to the story that kept getting passed down through the generations, my ancestor caught up with the group every week by Tuesday. (laughs) They kept on traveling. He stopped for a whole day. But every week by Tuesday, he'd make it. And his animals never had accidents or problems. He did not get sick, whereas the group kept running into problem after problem after problem. And he said, it's because you need to rest. You become more efficient in your work, and God honors you when you honor his commandments. 
We heard that in our second reading for today from Isaiah. If you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it not going your own ways or seeking your own pleasures or talking idly, then you shall take delight in the Lord and I will make you ride the heights of the earth. If you honor my Sabbath, God says, I will honor and bless you. And that's why I strive every week to take one day where I do not work. Before I even came here, when I was still negotiating with the pulpit nominating committee, I had it written into my contract. One day out of every seven was a Sabbath. Traditionally, I try to take Friday. Obviously, this is not a good day for me to take a Sabbath. You might get a little snarky if I kept not showing up on Sundays. So I try to take Friday as a Sabbath day. Because I know myself, I would become the worst workaholic in the world if I didn't do that. And when I don't get a day of rest each week, I promise you by the next week, sometime by Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I crash. I get sick or I get so exhausted I have to take an afternoon off and take a nap. I have that rhythm built in. And so on Fridays, I don't come into the office. I don't check my email. I screen my phone calls. I know some of you don't like that, but I promise you, if it's an emergency, if you need me, I will come on Friday. If you've gone into the hospital or you've got an emergency, leave a message on my phone. I check my messages. If you need me on Friday, I will come if I possibly can. But if it's something that can wait until Saturday, I'll call you back on Saturday. I, need, I have to set those boundaries to honor this commandment. We have to work to arrange our lives in such a way that we can accept this gift that God has given to us. And I still hear what some of you are thinking right now. That's all well and good, but I'm just too busy. I can't do it. I have too much going on. I cannot take a day of rest. So let me say something that's going to be really unpopular. If you are too busy to keep a commandment of God, then you are sinfully busy. If you are too busy for worship, if you are too busy for prayer, if you are too busy for some period of rest each week, if you are too busy to serve and to love and to do what God has commanded you to do, then you're doing too much. God never calls us to be frantic and overwhelmed. And there's something that you need to give up so that you can do what God is calling you to do. I don't know what that is that's between you and God. But if God can get his work done in six days, why should we think we need seven? How can we delude ourselves into thinking that our work is more important than God's? I realize there are emergency situations. There are times when that particular week or that particular season, it's just there's a lot going on. I get it. I understand that. God makes provisions for those times in his word. And we have to be careful that we don't turn one of God's good gifts into a heavy burden like they did in Jesus' day. Jesus fought with the Pharisees over and over again because they had ironically turned the Sabbath into hard work. And there was a list of 1,521 things that you were not allowed to do on the Sabbath. I'm not making that up. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about making a heavy burden in your life. I'm talking about accepting the gift that God gives. Where he calls us one day a week belonging to him. One day a week being about more than being a slave to our busyness, a slave to our self-importance, a slave to our wages. Accepting the gift that God gives because the Sabbath, God says, is a foretaste of the great Sabbath rest in heaven that we are all waiting for. A time of joy and rest and worship that God has in store for us. Why would we ever turn our backs on that and say that we are too busy and too important to accept what God has to give? 
Ultimately, it comes down to a question. Do you trust God enough to obey him? Are you so grateful to Jesus Christ for what he has done on the cross? Are you so in love with the Lord who has given himself for you that you are willing to live and to trust him with your time? Trust him with your schedule. Trust him with your agenda. Are you willing to give him one day in seven, a day of rest and worship and play? Let me reassure you, having worked to live this way in my own life, God knows what he's talking about. God made us. He knows how we work. He knows if we burn the candle at both ends long enough, we're going to burn out. And you'll get that rest somehow or other, but it'll be an enforced rest that you don't want. Let's submit to him. Let's remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Let's honor him in gratitude and obedience and live the life that he has called us to live. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To God alone be the glory. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this gift that you have given us. For some of us, it's a frightening prospect. So, Lord, we pray that you would give us wisdom. We pray that you would teach us to keep this commandment, to honor you with our time, to build time into our schedule for worship and rest and joy. Show us how it needs to be done, Lord. Give us courage. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing our middle hymn in the brown hymnal, number 12. <laughs>